You're listening to Pastor Stephen Anglis at Bayview Bible Church. Join us on Sundays for Focus Hour at 9.30 and worship service at 10.30. Scripture that is notorious for being incredibly complicated and incredibly frustrating. And pastors hate to preach verse by verse because they know that they're eventually going to find themselves wrapped up into one Sunday where they have to preach on verses like the verses we're going to look at. So usually I don't have you open to your Bible immediately, but I encourage you right now to just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and we'll be starting in verse 2. And while you do that, there's a little bit of something I want to tell you um, about the history of this world about the history of this universe. You guys know what the beginning was like. In the beginning, there was God. And God was one, yet God was also three at the same time. And God created the heavens and the earth, and there was nothing. It was darkness. You couldn't see anything. There was no form. You looked out and you saw black. But then God said, let there be light. And there was light. He looked out on the universe And he saw that it wasn't good quite yet. There was still more to be done. It was dark. So he created distinction. And he gave us something like this. He created light and he created dark. And then he created a separation between the sky and the water. And then he kept on going and he had even more distinctions. He decided that there was going to be a distinction between land and water. And that now there was going to be something called sea and there was going to be something uh, called ground. Just as there was going to be something called night and there was going to be something called day. Do you guys see a pattern of what's going on here? There's something about God that is unified. He's one, yet he's three. When he creates, he creates something that is uniform. He creates something that is universe. Yet part of his creation process was making distinction between night and day between sky and water, between land and sea. He continued on with the creation story and he made animals, female and male. He had plants on the ground and eventually he made man and he made woman. God loves distinction. And when God made man, he looked at man and what did God say about his creation? Most of it's good, It's good except for this one thing that is not good. It is not good for man to be alone. Just as it is not good for a universe to be in darkness. Just as it is not good for a world to be formless and only see. It is not good for man to be alone. God loves distinction. Distinction in God's creation is a reflection of God's very nature. He shows that he himself is God and he is one, yet he is also more than one. We call that the Trinity. And if you were to turn to Genesis, you would find that when God says, let us make man in our image, he doesn't say, let me make man in my image. He uses the plural because God loves distinction. And so we have man and we have woman. And then sin came, right? Sin came. And the distinctions that God made that were good were now suddenly added onto by distinctions that men were going to make as a result of their fallenness. Because of Cain's lack of faith, there was a distinction between his sacrifice and between his brothers. So we killed his brother. And as a result, cities were built and tribes were formed and we became people over here and they became people over there. And they tried to build a tower and they sinned against God and God scattered them by giving them different languages so that they would talk a certain way that was the right way and all those other people would talk other ways that were the wrong way. And do you see what's happening? There was distinctions that God made that were a reflection of his design, of his nature, that were good and perfect. And because of sin, we now see more distinctions that are not so good. Distinctions that lead to war. Distinctions that lead to genocide. It was for these very sinful distinctions that came up as a result of sin that God called his people to be holy, holy. 
He said, you don't marry their wives. You don't sleep with their women. Don't you eat their food. You stay separate over here. I don't want you getting entangled with these distinctions that are being made all throughout the rest of the world. But you guys know what comes next. Then comes Jesus. And Jesus comes into a world that is full of walls between people of different skin color, people of different cultures, people of different ethnicities, religions, theological beliefs, political beliefs. And all of these walls that had been built up, what did Jesus do? He started taking them down. He said, guess what? There's coming a day where we are going to worship in spirit and truth. And there won't be no more Jew nor Greek. There won't be a slave or a free. Jesus came to die for the world and in doing so, Jesus made clear in his ministry and Paul and his disciples were making clear in their ministry that Christianity was a religion that tore down the walls of distinction. There now would be no more slave nor free. That's taken care of. All nations now are all, go, every tribe, every tongue is going to proclaim God. That's taken away now. But then we come back to that. We come back to man. And we come back to woman. And that's a distinction that God says, no, I'm not going to change. That's a distinction that I am going to allow to remain. You guys have turned to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and hopefully you've picked on up on what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the difference between men and women and how men are meant to see themselves and how women are meant to see themselves. Because we live in a world where the distinction between men and women is trying to be done away with. You guys hear all kinds of phrases, maybe things like gender fluid, maybe, maybe things like uh, different pride comments about how gender shouldn't matter and how parents are encouraged to raise their children without a certain gender. Raise your boy just as whatever he wants to be, not as a boy or as a girl, but just as itself. Um, these are things that are permeating into our culture and I want to just say real quick, if we're coming from a non-biblical perspective, you can understand how they would see that that is the next logical conclusion. They would think to themselves, well, a hundred years ago, we, we, we dealt with civil rights and the difference between black and white. And so now today in the 21st century, we'll just deal with gender and, and we'll get rid of gender, just like we got rid of race and we'll tear down those distinctions. People tend to think that it's all one and the same, that doing away with gender and these gender roles between men and women is just the next logical problem that needs to be solved by, by a more evolving humanity. If you haven't heard comments like that yet, you definitely will. Those are comments that I heard even during my time at Moody from, from peers, uh, comments like that. Um, it's things that, that you'll hear on the news more and more. We're in a world that wants to do away with the distinction between man and woman. And Paul is going to take the next verses here in chapter 11 to draw that line in the sand. To make it very clear that, yes, there are many distinctions that are a result of sin that Jesus came to do away with or that Jesus came to supersede and, and to bring together despite differences. But there are some differences that need to remain the same, not because they are harmful, but because they are good. And that's what brings us to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul, this is the famous head covering chapter, uh, if you haven't heard about this topic, these are the verses that encourage women and say that women should wear head coverings. Um, and that's what we're going to walk through today, and we're not going to hide from that. or We're, we're not going to ignore that. But we're going to, we need to understand this passage and how it fits in 1 Corinthians. And we need to understand what's really going on here because I think very often we look at this passage as a passage that's about uh, worship practices, like what is the best way to worship if you're a man or if you're a woman? Or sometimes we think of it as some kind of passage on um, maybe like marriage roles, like who should wear the pants in a relationship kind of deal. 
And I think that the, the issue at heart here is actually much deeper. It goes deeper than the rituals that you should do to worship or the practicalities or the legalities of it. I think it even runs deeper than actually marriage itself. Um, marriage is a good place to start, but I think there's something deeper than just marriage going on here. Paul is talking about gender identity. He's talking about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman in this new world that the Corinthians are living in that we call the church age. So look with me at verse 2, and there's going to be something really interesting that's going to provide us a great hint that I'm going to need to talk about for a minute. Because if we don't get this, I think we're going to really go off track with this passage here. Uh, Paul, he starts out and he says, Now I commend you. That should be noticeable because Paul hasn't done a lot of commending to the Corinthians up to this point in this letter. So for the fact that he would say, I commend you, is worth noticing in of itself. He says, I commend you because you remember me in everything. I'm reading from the ESV. And maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. What in the world is Paul talking about with this verse? He says, I commend you because you remembered me and have maintained the traditions that I have taught you or that I have given you. What is Paul referring to here? We don't know for sure. Because remember, we're reading somebody else's email. Okay, that's what's going on here. We're, we're reading a letter that was part of a series of letters that we don't have the full email thread to. So, so we're looking at this letter in a vacuum. Obviously, Paul has had interactions with the Corinthians before this that we have not been privy to. But it seems to be pretty clear that before this time, Paul had given the Corinthians some basic Christian teaching about what it meant to be a Christian uh, in this new age, this church age, before Jesus Christ comes back. Um, we think, um, and this is kind of interesting, we think that maybe part of that teaching may have been some, uh, one of the early uh, apo apostolic letters. So like Galatians is a very early letter. It depends on the dating, which was written first, Corinthians or Galatians. Maybe Galatians may have been one that was written right before this that would have been included in the teaching or the tradition, as Paul gives it, of this early teaching that these Corinthians received. He's commending them because he says, hey, the, uh, the teaching that I've given you guys to what it means to be a Christian, you guys have received that well and you've shown a desire to follow it and, and you seem to want to maintain it. But there seems to be an issue here because Paul is going to start there and he's going to say, yeah, but there's these things that you're either not doing it full enough or you're going off the wrong track or there's something that they received in Paul's teaching that they either got wrong or that they didn't have quite enough information with yet. Um, one of the big theories, and we can't say this for sure, okay, this is, we're kind of like in this weird space out, out here where, 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 where the, we have to be careful. But if you turn to Galatians, one of the verses in Galatians uh, famously says, there is now therefore uh, no more slave no, nor free, no more uh, male nor female for all are one in Christ Jesus. That could have been one of the things that they had received in one way, shape, and form where they go, okay, we're now this Corinthian church and we used to be Jews and they used to be Gentiles, but now we have to come together. We have to ignore that distinction. And okay, there used to be masters and there used to be slaves, but all are one in Christ Jesus, so we have to allow them to come together to worship. If you were a Corinthian during this time, it's very likely that you might think, well, in the same way, is it okay for a woman to act like a man and is it okay for a man to act like a woman? These were the typical things that men used to do in Jewish tradition. Well, now since, we're, since the distinctions are taken away, is it now okay for a woman to do these man things? And, and is it now okay for maybe these men to take these female roles? That seems to be what is happening here. Because I want to continue on with, with the next few verses. But before we do that, actually there's one more slide I want to show you guys because this is so important. Two things that I really need your guys' help with. I should have already done this. Um, is, I'll do it better in the second service, is uh, as we go through this, please just remember that what we're going to be talking about today is a spiritual point. Uh, Paul's going to be dealing with spiritual things here. Um, that's going to be really important. Uh, the spiritual importance of manhood and womanhood. 
Uh, this goes beyond just some of the cultural things that we already talked about. But also the second one, just for my benefit, the Bible is perfect. Pastors are not perfect. So I may say something or I may say a phrase that just really offends you. Um, maybe you need to be offended. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but if there's a question or if there's a comment or if something just doesn't seem to jive quite right, use this as an opportunity to reach out to me. Let's continue this conversation as time goes on. Um, God's word is perfect, and I have the task of trying to deal with it, even some of the difficult passages. Give me grace, and let's work through this together. Um, but with that being said, let's continue reading now verse 3. Uh, Paul says, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. These are things that we've heard before. Paul uh, is later going to write things like this in the book of Ephesians. Um, then he goes on in verse 4 and he says, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. That was a no-go back then. You didn't do that. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head was shaven. Let's keep going a little bit. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her then cover her head. For a man not, ought not to cover his head, since he is the image of the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. That was when you guys were supposed to say, Amen. Amen. Um, amen. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Uh, that is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. And we'll talk about that whole angel comment, and I'll try not to spend an hour on it. Let's stop there for a second. This is a hard passage to talk through. I think that if the letter of 1 Corinthians, let's just use our imagination here. If the letter of 1 Corinthians had been written in like 19th century America, the Victorian England, I think the way this chapter would have gone would have been Paul saying, hey, now men wear britches and girls wear dresses. And some of you guys are telling me or you're asking me whether it's okay for um, girls who wear dresses to now wear britches and, and guys who wear britches to now wear dresses. And let me tell you, that just shouldn't be the case. Um, I, th I think we would probably find something like that in this chapter. Um, because the point is not Paul saying whether or not you should wear a dress. The, the point Paul is trying to make is should uh, men fulfill their cultural expectations of manhood and should women fulfill their cultural expectation, expectations of womanhood. In the same way, if this letter had happened between Paul and the Corinthians um, in 21st century America, I think it would maybe go something like this. Um, Churches, you should continue to have bathrooms just for men, and you should continue to have bathrooms just for women. Because that is kind of the cultural question that we're dealing with right now, of how do we have distinction between these two things. So there's a part of us where we have to recognize that this is cultural, that there's examples that are happening here that are physical, that just don't apply anymore. I'm going to tell you that no, women, you do not need to wear a head covering today because we do not live in a culture that is involved with head coverings. But what I am going to say is that men should embrace their role as men. They should find their identity in their manhood. And in the same way, women, you should embrace your womanhood and find your identity in your womanhood. And the question to all of that would be why? What's the point? Why would God make such a big deal about saying there's no difference between a slave and a master and no difference between a Jew and a Gentile, but he would now draw the line and Paul would say, no, uh, you sh there should still now be distinction between how a woman acts in her society and how a man acts in his society. The reason for that is because it goes back to what we talked about at the beginning. Distinction in creation is a picture of God's nature. It's a picture of who God is on multiple fronts. One, I think it shows uh, man and woman, they are the same. Woman came from man, they are same flesh, same bone, same material, same soul, both made in the image of God, yet so incredibly different, right? In the same way, God is one. God the Father, Jesus Christ are one, they are equal. They are equal. 
Yet there's also distinction between the two. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Distinction, yet uniformity. I think that there's a picture of that going on here between man and woman. Also, I also want you to recognize when Paul talks about where man comes from. Where does man come from? He comes from God. Where does woman come from? Woman comes from man. If we take that out of the equation, if we try to erase this mindset that, hey, uh, woman came out of man himself, she was a part of man, she was drawn out of man, then logically we also have to take it to the next step that also denies that man was taken out of God. Man was formed by God. That was part of God's design. And because God made Adam in his own image, as a result, Eve, woman, is also in God's image because Eve was taken out of man. By recognizing that, by showing that, we are pointing back to the fact that it is God who has created and it is God who has created all things originally good and perfect. To take away distinction between man and woman is to take away the intention of God's design from the beginning. Verse 9. I'm sorry, verse 10. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head uh, because of the angels. Uh, just quickly, we have no idea what that verse means, okay? Um, I love being able to say that. Um, I looked at a lot of theories. I think most of them are terrible. I don't say that, I don't say that haughtily. I, most of them are really bad. The one that I thought was the best, I'll share with you. And, and just know that this is a theory, and, and I think it fits. But um, the fall of angels, the fall of Satan occurred because Satan refused to see the distinction between himself and God. He refused to recognize where he came from and who God was and the distinction between that. He saw his own glory, he saw God's glory, and he said, I don't see a difference. And if anything, I actually see me as greater than it. As a result, he fell, and all the angels who believed as he did fell with him. I think that is, and again, so let's just say that that's just Stephen talk. We won't, we won't call that inspired. That, that's just for fun, okay? Um, we really don't know what that means. It's very possible that maybe there was just some kind of cultural um, thing that Christians like to say back then that maybe Paul was referencing that we don't say anymore. Um, but even if that's not what it means, I still think looking to that point in history is a great parallel to this. I, I think it's a great thing to look at. Um, verse 11, Nevertheless, in the Lord, women, uh, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. I love that verse. Woman is not independent of man, and the Lord knows man is not independent of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. See that? Women came from man, but men are born from woman, even the greatest man, Jesus Christ. And all things are therefore from God. 13. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, and I appreciate him putting this verse in as well. It's like he knew what the next 2,000 years were going to look like for pastors. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. How should we walk away from all this? We need to recognize that when Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he was writing to people that in that day, being a woman meant that you, your head was covered. That's what that meant. That's what that looked like. That, that was part of womanhood in that society, just like womanhood looks differently in different cultures and different societies. In the same way, when Paul was writing back then, being a man and how you worshiped, not having a covering uh, was part of what it meant to be a man in that society. And we could go through and talk about all the history as to why women wore coverings and why that was actually a really good thing and why men didn't wear coverings. I don't really think it matters so much for, for us right now. Uh, we're living in 2020. Those things are fun for history, and 
I encourage you guys to look those things up or we can talk about it and we can have fun discussions about it. But I don't really think that's the point for us today. The point is, is now we live in 2020 and we have to say, how do we as Christians live in a world that is attacking the identity of men and women? How do we fight against that? How can we uh, fight for gender? How can we apply this passage? Um, I do not believe that women need to wear head coverings to, to go to church. Um, I do not believe that, that men are going to have lightning strike them if they wear a hat when, when they come to church service. I think it's a good practice to do. I, I don't. Um, but, but I recognize that those are cultural things and, and the deeper heart of the matter is how are we treating men? How are we treating women? And there's a few things that I want to throw up that I think would be good points of application. Um, yeah, let's stop on this one real quick. God chose unity through distinction. If there's one big idea, that was kind of the big idea I was really clinging on to. I encourage you guys to write that down. God shows unity through distinction. I know today's a little bit of a different sermon, but let's look at, well, let's look at some application right now. Um, how can we apply this verse, even if we're not going to have women wear head coverings, and even though guys can come into church or walk on the street and, and not wear a hat, how do we define this? I think, number one, I think we should celebrate gender within our family. I think we should praise our wives for their womanhood. All women have beauty. Um, we should be thankful for the women that God has put in our life and celebrate that accordingly. That doesn't mean that we should objectify women according to their physical attributes. There's so much more than that. Uh, but we should uh, praise God's design, and, and we should delight in that, and, and we should love them and let them know that they are loved um, and that they are beautiful. And in the same way, I think we've talked a lot about women, but I think in the same way, uh, men, uh, men are builders, uh, men are conquerors, they're explorers. Um, a way that we can celebrate manhood is to encourage those things. Um, the last thing I want to do is to try to suggest that a personality type is what it means to be a gender, that being female means that you have some kind of stereotype of a personality of, of what we think a woman is, and in the same way we think, well, in order to be a man, you have to be, you know, a certain way. Um, David wrote poetry and music and had a best friend that he embraced and, and, and cried over, um, things that we would not necessarily call manly today, but I don't think anyone's going to say that King David was not the picture of a man. Um, we need to celebrate those things. When you raise your kids, um, encourage them in their identity encourage them in their gender. Um, that's the first thing that is part of their identity when they are born. Their name and it's a boy or it's a girl. Celebrate those things. Raise them accordingly. They're allowed, girls are allowed to like things that boys like and, and boys are allowed to like things that girls like. There's always going to be cultural weird things that go on. But we should always recognize that distinction and we should never be okay with uh, allowing those lines of distinction to go away. Uh, we should raise our boys as boys and we should raise our girls as girls. And you can see all the points up here, I know. Um, but number two, stand up for God's definition of gender, I think, publicly. I, I, think, uh, I think over the next few decades, we're going to see public schools changing in ways where, where, where stuff like this happens. I think churches are going to be pressured uh, to make changes and distinctions between men and women. We need to stand up and fight against that. Not because it's a political issue, but because it's a biblical issue. That's the thing. Uh, I get so tired of Christians just being political activists. Yeah, we need to be political activists, but we need to be gospel activists first. We need to be fighting for the gospel that says that Christ died for all, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, man and woman. And that as a woman, Christ died for you completely for who you are, even though you are equal with man and women are equal with men. God made them differently, yet equal in the same. Man is born of woman, woman came from man. They are so beautifully intertwined, yet there's distinction. I think that's a picture of God. We need to fight for those things publicly in our society, in our church. We should not, as a church, I would say this to any local church, ever be willing to give up that line. It's not a race issue. It's not an equality issue. This is a biblical issue. The very reason why I think Paul even had to give this was because I think, and you can write down those words, Stephen thinks, 
But I think what's going on here is that they received this teaching of equality in Christ, okay? They received this teaching of equality in Christ, and they were so excited about it, they took it to heart so much that they naturally thought, well, men and women are equal now, therefore men can act like women and women can act like men. It's because of the equality between the two genders that Paul has to provide this extra teaching. I think that's a really important thing to remember. It's because there already seemed to be a mindset that there was now equality between the genders in a way that didn't exist before that Paul has to give this clarification. So we need to fight for these things. And then the third point I think may be the one point that is forgotten the most or it may be the point that is the hardest to follow. But I think right now in 2020 is also one of the most important points to remember in applying this. And the fact of the matter is, is that yes, there are going to be people that say, I was born a boy, but I believe I'm a girl. Or I was born a girl and I believe I'm a boy. Or I was told I'm supposed to uh, feel this way about this gender, but I feel this way about another gender. We need to recognize that that's going to exist. And we need to see them as Jesus sees them. As people that he died for as people that are still made in his image, and that people that need to be loved despite the brokenness of a sinful world and sinful flesh that we still have hanging on us. Each and every one of us has sinful physical habits and traits that are always going to impact our person until we die. Whether it's lust or gluttony or anger or attitude, these are always going to be things that are part of simply living in the flesh that we're going to have to groan with and we're going to have to struggle with until we can tear off this old body. In the same way, we need to recognize that there are people who struggle in these ways for the same reasons. We need to be patient with them. We need to love them. We need to not say, well, these people clearly didn't read 1 Corinthians. That's not the attitude. We don't want to say, well, these people clearly don't love God or these people clearly uh, have been taught something that is wrong. It may be true that they have received bad teaching, but what they need right now is love and specifically a love that points to Jesus. A love that points to Jesus. This is a weird, hard, difficult, uh, frustrating passage. But what it all comes down to, I think, is the passage that happened right before that we talked about last Sunday. When in doubt, love God. When you don't know how to do that, love people. We need to apply that in our marriages and in our families, in our societies, and in our churches. The cultures are always going to change. What different societies and cultures say about gender identities is gonna be different, that's okay. But we need to recognize that distinction and use it as a way to worship God. Pray with me.